mean, we hear that passage a lot, right? But have you ever took a moment just to think how much God truly does love this world? How much He loves each and every one of us here in this building this morning? And the thing is, we don't have to think for that long, do we? Because God tells us how much He loves us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. In 1 John 4 and verse 10, turn there with me. 1 John 4 and verse 10. In 1 John 4 and verse 10, this is how much God loves you. 1 John 4 and verse 10. It says this, And this is love, not that we love, but Christ loved us. And He sent His Son to be the price for our sins. Despite our sin, despite our rejection of God, He still loved us to send Jesus, His Son, to die for our sins. That's a love that's deeper than the ocean and wider than than the sea. It's a love that gives up Himself. Gives for a people that over and over again reject Him and leave Him and disobey Him. But He still loves us. And our God is love. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not sure about this God thing. You're not sure about your relationship with Him or if He cares about you or if He wants you. But I want you to know this morning, as Mr. Rusty pointed out in his Scripture, that God loves you so much and nothing will separate His love from your soul. In Romans 8, in Romans 8, and verse 38, I'll read it for you. You don't have to turn there. But it says this, For I am convinced, Paul says, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And because of this love, because of God's love for us, we can be in a relationship with Him. He is our God, and we are His people. In a covenant relationship through the blood of Jesus. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That it's no longer about what we sacrifice on the altar. It's no longer about what family you're born into, but it's about having a God that loved His people so much that He would send Jesus Christ to die for each and every one of us, to bring all peoples to Himself, to be in a relationship with them. Israel in the time of the kings didn't understand how much this relationship was worth, how much their special relationship was with God was worth. And so God is going to use a prophet to help the people to understand in some way what it is like to be Him and to have a people over and over again turn from Himself when all He wants them to do is be faithful to Him. And He's going to use the prophet Hosea. And God is going to ask something of Hosea so Hosea can understand in some way what it is like to be God and how much God loved Israel. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Hosea this morning. If you have no idea where Hosea is, head to Psalms and you're going to head to the right. And you're going to go past Isaiah and Jeremiah. And once you get to Daniel, you're going to want to slow down and turn a couple pages and we'll be in the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Can we read the story of Hosea together this morning? Hosea chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It says this, The word of the Lord which came to Hosea, the son of Bere, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, the sons of Joash, kings of Israel, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of harlotry, and have children of harlotry forsaking, or for the Lord, or for the land commits flagrant harlotry forsaking the Lord. Can we stop there for just a moment? The very first thing God is going to tell Hosea is, Hosea, I want you to do something. I want you to go marry a prostitute, Hosea. Hosea, I imagine, didn't envision himself when thinking of his 10-year plan prior to this, that he was going to marry a prostitute. Because why? Well, a prostitute is someone who's going to take advantage of him. Someone looked down by the religious society. Someone who's going to leave him for the next best thing. I'm sure Hosea understands that. 
But God tells him, Hosea, I want you to marry a prostitute. And he goes, and he finds the harlot Gomer, and he will marry her. Continue reading with me in verse 3. It says this, So he went, speaking of Hosea, and he took Gomer, the daughter of Dillam, and she conceived, and she bore a son. And the rest of chapter 1 would go on to describe how Hosea and Gomer would have three children in total together. Hosea will go and he will find the prostitute Gomer. He will marry her as God commanded. He will have children as God commanded. But that's not the end of the story, is it? I wish it was because that's somewhat of a good story, I guess. But remember, God has a purpose with this book. And so when we get to chapter 3, Gomer is gone. She has committed adultery and left her husband. In Hosea 3 and verse 1, it says this, Then the Lord said to me, Hosea, Go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. And in chapter 2, chapter 2, it both speaks of the nation of Israel and Gomer, but in chapter 2 and verse 1, This is when Hosea has discovered his adulterous wife, discovered what she has done to him in their relationship. In Hosea 2 and verse 1, it says this, Say to your brothers and me and to your sisters Ramah, contend with your brothers, contend, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her be put away from her harlotry from her face and her adultery between her breasts. Gomer has left him. And as we'll see in chapter 3, the only way to get her back is Hosea will have to go and seek her out and buy her. But she has disregarded the relationship between her and her husband. She's left him for another. I think sometimes we miss this side of Hosea. We become so focused on the redemption story, how Hosea is going to come back and he's going to buy her, and he's going to take her back to himself, that we miss what Gomer has done. How truly awful things are at this point. This is real life. Gomer has committed adultery against her husband. She's been with Hosea a long time. If I had to guess, probably a couple years. They've had several children together. And during that time, the text says she was a woman loved. Hosea, I want you to go again, and I want you to love her. I don't know what their relationship looked like, or if they fought, or if they're rich, or poor, but God's word tells me that Hosea loved this woman. And that means she had something special. She was a nobody. She was looked down on society, uh, looked down by religious people for her job and for being a woman. She was alone. She lived man to man, but not with one that ever truly loved her for who she was. Because that's the thing about prostitution, isn't it? It was never about her needs. It was never about if she had a bad day. It was never what they could do for her. It was always about what they or she could do for them. That was the life of Gomer before Hosea. Hosea wouldn't have chosen this woman on his own. No man would choose her to be the person they share a deep and intimate relationship with. But God told Hosea, Hosea, I want you to marry the prostitute. Hosea, go marry this person no one else wants. And Hosea went and he found Gomer and he loved her. Hosea could have married this woman and there not be love in that relationship. We've all seen that, right? Uh, Maybe for money or status, maybe it's an arranged marriage and they get married and there's no love in that relationship. The, The marriage aspect, the love aspect is seen as a chore rather than a privilege and a blessing, something to be enjoyed. But the text says Gomer was a woman who was loved by Hosea. But what did she do with that love? With that relationship with her husband, that covenant relationship with a man who was willing to give her a second chance? She disregarded it. And she committed adultery against the man who loved her. Can we just take a minute to realize what God is asking here? To think about this story, God is asking Hosea to take back his adulterous wife 
I want you to imagine yourself in this situation. I can't because I'm not married. I haven't shared this special and intimate relationship, but many of you have. I want you to think about what Hosea is being asked here. Hosea, I want you to go marry this person, this person that you sought out, this person that you've invested time and energy to, but they have left you. They've disregarded you. They've cheated on you. They've loved another person other than yourself. But I want you to go back, and I want you to love her and take her back to yourself and be faithful to her. There's a reason in the New Testament that Jesus only gives one way to divorce, and that is through immorality and adultery. When a, per- can, when a person commits adultery, that covenant relationship, those vows are broken. And God hates divorce, but you know what else God hates? God hates adultery. Gomer broke the covenant between her and her husband, all why Hosea loved her. But the story, if you remember, has a purpose. And God would come back to Hosea in chapter 3, and he would tell her or him, go again and love her. Can we look at the response of Hosea, chapter, or Hosea this morning? In Hosea 3 and verse 1. This is the response of Hosea. The Lord said to me, go again. Love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So here's the response, verse 2. So I, bought her, I brought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer of half of barley. And I said to her, you shall, not, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot nor shall you have a man, so I will be towards you. God comes back to Hosea. He tells Hosea, I want you to go find her. I want you to seek her out, and I want you to love her again. And that's what Hosea does. He goes, and he seeks her out, and he finds this adulterous woman who shouldn't be worth his time of day at this point. She's been put away, chapter 2 tells us. But he goes back to her. And we truly see how much Hosea loves this woman because him going to her, him seeking her out, him having compassion and mercy for her isn't enough because Hosea is going to have to pay a price for this woman. He must give up himself to buy back an unfaithful woman who has left him alone, who has walked away from a relationship with a loving husband, and Hosea will pay the price. He will give up his shekels, his 15 shekels and his barley, and he will take her back and he will love her again. And Hosea doesn't yell at her when she comes back. He doesn't nag her about the price or how far he had to go, but I love this. Look at what Hosea says to her. He says, you will dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the harlot or belong to another man, and so I will be towards you. Gomer, I'll be yours forever if you choose to be mine, but you've got to stop on yours. I'll be faithful to you. You have to be faithful to me. Have you ever wondered how much God loves you? Have you ever taken a minute to think about how much God loves you? Because remember, God had a purpose behind this book and behind the life of Hosea. God says in chapter 2 and verse 1, because the land commits harlotry forsaking the Lord. And in chapter 3 and verse 1, yet an adulteress, even as the sons of Israel, though they love other gods and love raisin cakes. Hosea went through all of this so he in some way could feel what God felt. How he could experience the pain of of having an adulterous partner in a covenant relationship and loving her, regardless of what she did, and seeking her out and bringing her back to himself. Israel at this time are God's people. It is chosen and special people in a covenant relationship like no other in the world at this time with him. But just like Gomer, Israel disregards the relationship, and they'll follow after their own gods. And they will leave the Lord their God, who loved them. Here's what God has to say about His people. 
in chapter 4, in verse 10, it says this in chapter 4, in verse 10, this is God through the prophet Hosea speaking of his people. It says this in chapter 4, in verse 10, they will eat, speaking of Israel, but not have enough. They will play the harlot, but not increase, because they have stopped giving heed to the Lord. Harlotry, wine, and new wine take away the understanding. My people consult their wooden idol, and their diviners wands inform them, for a spirit of harlotry has led them astray. They have played the harlot, departing from their God. And in chapter 11, in chapter 11, if this doesn't move you, I want you to think about how much God loves his people, the story of Hosea leading up to chapter 11. I want you to think that this is God, creator of the universe, who made every one of us. And this is what he says about us in the nation of Israel. In chapter 11 and verse 1, it says this, When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. The more they called him, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of man and with bonds of love. And I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws. I bent down and I fed them. They will not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria. He will be their king because they have refused to return to me. The sword will whirl against their cities and demolish their gate bars and consume them because of their counsels. So my people are bent on turning from me, though they call them to the one on high. No one exalts him. God is heartbroken over his people. He says, I remember when the nation was young. I remember my people. I loved them. He talks about how he's always been there working behind the scenes leading them with his chosen leaders, healing them. But what does Israel do? They sin. They rebel. They forget about God because they become so consumed with being like the nations around them that they forget how much God loves them and what he has done for them. And God can't help but do or punish them at this point because they have become so adulterous towards himself. But the story doesn't stop in Hosea. Because Hosea is a foreshadow of the greatest price that will ever be paid for God's people. Notice in in Hosea how Hosea would have to go back to his wife and he'd have to buy her back to bring her, her to himself. But God doesn't buy back his people in Hosea. And that's because God had a plan for his nation. To buy them back once and for all with the greatest price that will ever be paid. The story of Hosea is the gospel. It is the story of how God loved, and He loved so much that that He would seek us out when we were dead in sin, sold into slavery, slavery, when we weren't worth anything to Him. But instead of just forgetting us, instead of just putting us away, He'll come back to us, and He will buy us back and free us by paying the price through his son Jesus. For a people who are not worthy, a people who reject God consistently, who seek their own gods, a love despite all of that, Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20, it tells us we've been bought with a price, and we know from 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, that that was a great price. It was the price of the precious blood of the Lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. It's interesting, and you can take this with a grain of salt, it's interesting that to buy Gomer back, he would spend 15 shekels and about five bushels of barley. And most scholars believe that the five bushels of barley would have equaled an additional 15 shekels. And so to buy Gomer back, he would spend 30 shekels silver. We too have been saved through the price of 30 shekels because if you remember 
That's the price Judas would receive to hand over Jesus, which would lead to his crucifixion. And because of that, because of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, him leaving heaven, him being lowered, we read in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, read this with me, Ephesians 1 and verse 7. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. It says this. In Him, speaking of Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and in insight. And in chapter 2 and verse 1, when you were dead, in your trespasses and sin, when you weren't worthy of any of this, when you were Gomer, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, verse 3, among them we too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in all the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were children of wrath, even as the rest. But verse 4 says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love which He had for us, even when you were dead in your transgressions, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. God cares so much about us. If Hosea teaches us anything this morning, it's that God cares and He wants us so badly. He teaches us that. We are in an intimate relationship with God, and He is wanting our faithfulness towards Him. All He asks is that we remain faithful to Him, and He will be faithful to us. God says, I will always love you. I will always be a faithful partner to you, but you've got to stop on your end, and you've got to be faithful to me. But the sad reality is, That despite God loving us, despite Him buying us back, despite His faithfulness towards us, despite that ultimate price that would be shed through His Son, Jesus, we break His heart because we commit adultery against Him so many times. You remember when God looked down on the earth in Genesis uh, before the flood, He looked down in Genesis 6, 5, and 6, and it said, All the thoughts of man were wicked. And do you remember what I said about God? And God was grieved. Realize that God loves us so much that when we break our end of the covenant, when we commit adultery against Him, it disappoints Him. But He doesn't punish us. He extends grace and grace so we can continue to be His. Isn't that powerful? We are Gomer. That's a humbling realization, isn't it? We're always quick to look at others and critique their lives, critique their faith, gossip about them and what they did wrong on this day. But we're all Gomer. We have all committed adultery against our God. We could change the the name of the book to Jesus, and we could change the name of the prostitute to Carson, couldn't we? It's the story of how God would seek us out. Uh, There's a reason I didn't have a PowerPoint or slides or the three-point application thing. Because the application is this. That we are Gomer. That we commit adultery against our God. Uh, But with that realization comes a response, doesn't it? A response of faithfulness. Because when I see how faithful God is towards me, even when I sin and I mess up, He still wants me and He still loves me and nothing separates me from that love. When I see that, I'm going to be faithful to Him because of His faithfulness towards me. Because He chose me. Despite of who I am, despite of what I had to offer, He said, Carson, I will be faithful to you. There's one last connection between the book of Hosea and the Gospels. The connection between Hosea and Jesus, and that's actually their names, which is really cool. Hoshea and Yeshua. Hosea and Jesus. 
Oshia or, or Hosea literally means salvation. And it is, isn't that fitting? Because wasn't Hosea salvation for Gomer? He would go find this woman no one else wanted. He would save her from her former life. He would bring her back to himself. Hosea was salvation. The name of Jesus, Yeshua, means Jehovah saves. Or you could say it like this, salvation from Jehovah. We need Hosea. We need that salvation. But you know the only thing that allows us to access that? That was that price, wasn't it, in the book of Hosea? And for us, Jehovah saves through Jesus. That is the price. Thank you so much for your attention. Can we read Titus 2 together as we wrap this sermon up? In Titus chapter 2. In Titus 2 and verse 11, it says this. Read with me. Titus 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us, to buy us back to himself from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possessions, zealous for good works. Have you ever thought about how much God loves you? I hope the book of Hosea has been a reminder of that this morning. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Maybe there's someone here this morning. Chances are that that you've lived a life like Gomer. You've lived a life devoted to your own pleasures, to the things you want in this life. Uh, But you read this story and you think, man, I I want a part of that. I want to be in a relationship with God who is faithful to me despite of what I do and where I am. But he will love me regardless of that. We want to make that possible for you this morning. God asks that you be faithful to him towards believing repenting, and confessing, and being baptized in the forgiveness of your sins, and living a faithful life towards Him. And you can be in that relationship with Him, a relationship with the God who will love you so much that He will forgive you through the blood of Jesus whenever you fall short. But the chances are, more realistically, is that there's someone here who has been in that relationship as Gomer was who has been in this relationship with God maybe for weeks or years, but you've turned away from Him. And you have left the God that loves you. He wants you to make that right this morning. He wants wants to bring you back to Himself, but you've got to make that decision to be faithful towards Him. We can pray with you. We can help you. Whatever the case may be, come forward right now as we stand and as we sing. Jesus, the question comes to you.